Hello, and welcome back to the Crime Reel. I'm delighted to be working with Hunter Killer as today's sponsor of this video. I get together with a great bunch of friends once a month and we work through these as a team. In every box you get a pack that sets the scene with lots of puzzles and clues for you to solve. Eventually you will get to find out who the killer is. Hunter Killer allows you to immerse yourself into the story and it allows you to play detective. With this latest box for me, I even feel as though I've been to Mallory Rock. There is a spoiler free online community of over 100,000 members if you get stuck or want to chat. Also, part of the proceeds go towards the Cold Case Foundation, an organisation dedicated to solve real life cold cases. To buy Hunter Killer now, visit hunterkiller.com slash crime reel and enter crime reel to get $10 off your purchase. There is a link in the description. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be visiting Florida in the USA to look at the complicated lives of the King family. Terry Lee King was born in Florida on the 17th of April 1961. At around the age of 23, Terry and his girlfriend Janet Little started living together and they went on to have two children. First they had Derek who was born on the 4th of May 1988 and Alex who was born 14 months later on the 12th of July 1989. The couple struggled financially and the relationship broke down in 1992 when the boys were 3 and 4 years old. However, Terry and Janet continued to live in the same house for a further 2 years during which time Janet gave birth to twin boys fathered by another man. Despite no longer being together, Terry and Janet co-parented the four boys. Sadly though, with minimal income, they could not afford to raise them. In 1994, they became aware of the Heritage Christian Academy, which was a crisis home for children. Reverend Steve Zepp, the director of the academy, took in all four boys and presented the idea of open adoptions. This is where the children lived with a new family, but were regularly in touch with their biological parents, Terry and Janet. Janet said that she was told that sometimes the best thing that you can do for your children is to give them up, and she has always maintained that the couple were doing what they believed was in the children's best interests. Janet moved out of Terry's house, but remained living in the area. Around this time, Terry secured a job at Pace Printing where he worked the 2pm to 10pm shift. The job was not well paid and therefore money was still a cause of concern. In 1995, after the boys had been at the academy for around 8 months, it had to close down as the church could no longer afford the upkeep. All four of the boys were placed with new families. The twins went to a family in Pace and Derek was placed with Frank Lay, who was the principal of Pace High School, and his wife, Nancy. Alex went to another family, but did not settle well. He cried all the time, and within a month, the family said that it wasn't going to work, so Alex returned to live with his father, Terry. Unable to afford childcare, Alex would often accompany Terry to work. He would stay in the lunchroom, reading, colouring, or even playing on his Game Boy. And when he was tired, he would drag two chairs together in order to go to sleep. He was exceptionally well behaved and, appreciating the struggles of being a single father, Terry's boss turned a blind eye to this unconventional arrangement. Over the next few years, Janet would often visit Alex and the twin boys, but after visiting Derek once at the Lay's house, she never returned. In 1997, Terry and Alex moved in with a family friend Joseph Tibbles and his 13 year old daughter. They lived with them for about a year whilst Terry was trying to get his finances in order. In 1998, Janet married and moved away to Lexington, Kentucky. She claims that after the move, she stayed in contact with the twins and Alex, but no longer visited them. Over time, it is believed that Derek's behavior declined and he started to get into minor problems at school. 
Derek could be unruly and rebellious, but was generally seen as popular, polite and fun. By the summer of 2001, things finally seemed to be falling into place for Terry. He had just bought a car and had moved into a rental house. The house had a large garden, which Terry really enjoyed working on, often with 12-year-old Alex at his side. Around the 25th of September 2001, Janet received a call from Nancy Lay about Derek. Janet said that Nancy told her that they could no longer cope with the 13-year-old as he was disrupting their lives too much. They had tried everything to help him, but it just wasn't working anymore. The following week, Derek went to live with Terry and Alex. Derek found the move difficult as he had had to leave his friends behind and was now living in a far more rural area. He went from having lots of friends and participating in sports and school activities to spending time with his brother at his father's place of work every evening. In October of 2001, the boys were enrolled into Ransom Middle School. Both of them were academically bright, above average students. There were a few teething problems with the boys settling into a new school and Derek into his new home. But when Terry spoke to Janet on the 14th of November, he said that things were now going great and the two boys were getting along well. Two days later, at 5.52pm on the 16th of November, Terry contacted Escambia County Sheriff's Office to report that his children were missing. He said that he did not believe that they had run away as they had seemed fine and nothing other than a Game Boy was missing. He had not seen them since he dropped them at school in the morning and he feared that they had been taken. The following day, Terry said that one of the boys, it is unclear whether this was Derek or Alex, called him to say that they knew he was looking for them, but they wouldn't be coming back. Around this time, Terry withdrew the two boys from school. On November the 20th, Terry called the sheriff's office again to see if there was any news on the boys' whereabouts, and then the following day, he re-enrolled the boys into school, even though they were still missing. Thursday the 22nd of November was Thanksgiving, and Terry had been due to visit his father, Wilbur. He did not show up, Wilbur, who did not speak to his son often, became concerned when he did not arrive as planned. Terry, meanwhile, was in contact with the local news to say that his sons were missing from home and that he had filed a missing persons report with the sheriff's office, but that investigators seemed to be doing nothing to find the boys. Two days later, Derek was found by Santa Rosa sheriff deputies in a wooded area in Pace, and he was returned to Terry. The following day, Sunday, November the 25th, Alex also returned home. That evening, the three of them were seen outside their home by neighbours as they left to go and visit a friend. They returned home at around midnight. About an hour later, at 1am on Monday the 26th of November, the fire brigade were called to Terry's home on the 1100 block of Muscogee Road. The house was burning on one side and it took approximately 30 minutes to contain the fire. When the firefighters entered the house, they discovered 40-year-old Terry's body. This was on the side of the house which hadn't been touched by the fire. He had significant wounds to his head and it was clear that he had been murdered. Both Derek and Alex were missing. A murder investigation was soon underway with investigators trying to establish who could have had a motive to kill Terry. Whilst concern mounted for the two missing boys, Monday passed with little development in the case. Then, late on Tuesday afternoon, the boys were found having been dropped off at the sheriff's office by a family friend. They were safe and unharmed. Shockingly, later that day, the two brothers aged 13 and 12 were charged with killing their father. They were charged with an open count of murder, meaning that it would leave the prosecutors or grand jury to determine which degree of murder the boys would be prosecuted for. Under Florida law, juveniles can be tried as adults for any crime that is punishable by death or life in prison. The prosecutors still had to decide whether the boys would be prosecuted as adults and were convicted of first degree murder, they would automatically receive life sentences without the possibility of parole. The two boys were held without bail at a juvenile detention centre. On 29th of November, 
The prosecutor confirmed that they would be asking the grand jury to indict the boys on adult charges and it was also likely that arson charges would be brought pending the outcome of the arson investigation. The following day, their father was laid to rest at the Eastern Gate Memorial Gardens after a service at Faith Chapel Funeral Home on Beverly Parkway in Pensacola. A newspaper report published on the 1st of December detailed information from an unnamed 40-year-old man who described himself as a close friend of Terry. This man stated that Derek and Alex believed that they were being psychologically abused by their father and that Alex had said that he wished his father was dead. This man went on to state that Terry was a control freak who did not allow the boys to interact with others. They had to return home straight after school and then Terry would pick them up and take them to his place of work. He also claimed that Terry had nailed the windows shut and installed double key locks on all of the doors in the house. The controlling behaviour was reportedly getting worse when Derek had returned to the family home, becoming the focus of his father's attention. At this point, Terry's interactions with Alex had become increasingly negative. During the newspaper interview, the man stated that he had received a telephone call from an unknown woman the previous Tuesday instructing him to drive slowly north on East Spencer Field Road in Pace. When he did so, he saw the boys coming out of the woods. This man then picked up the boys, took them to his home and contacted a friend who was a deputy sheriff. The boys told him that they had killed their father while he was sleeping and had then been hiding in the woods. The man then took the boys to the sheriff's office where he stayed with them during their police interviews and was later allowed to get them dinner from a fast food restaurant. He said that he hoped to testify on their behalf due to what they had been through with their father. However, this newspaper report did not seem to line up with how many other people viewed Terry. Janet, the boy's mother said that he was a strict but fair parent who didn't even shout at his children. She said that he didn't have a mean bone in his body and adored his children using the words quiet and passive to describe him. Joseph Tibbles, with whom Terry and Alex had lived for a year, described Alex as a lovely, well-mannered child and Terry to be a protective, loving father. His 13-year-old daughter, who knew Alex well, said that he had never uttered a bad word against his father. Terry's mother described him as a very giving person who would help anyone and then his father stated that he was a quiet, hard-working man, a sentiment echoed by his colleagues at the printing company. On the 11th of December, the two boys were indicted on adult charges of first-degree murder. Just before the indictments were returned, 40-year-old Ricky Marvin Chavis, the unnamed family friend from the earlier newspaper report, was arrested after testifying at the grand jury proceeding. He was charged with accessory after the fact, a crime that could lead to a potential 30-year prison sentence. The police believed that the boys had called him from a convenience store after setting their house on fire and told him what they had done. He took them to his home and washed their clothes, even though he knew that they had killed their father. At this stage, the nature of Ricky's relationship with the boys was unclear, but he had obviously been known to Terry, who had given him permission to pick Derek up from school. Ricky, who had a 1984 conviction for sexually abusing two 13-year-old boys, was held on a $50,000 bond. That evening, his mobile home was searched by the police, the home had elaborate security precautions. It was surrounded by a tall wooden fence that required an electronic keypad to open. There was electric wire over the fence, numerous warning signs and several surveillance cameras. His neighbours said that they did not know him well but would often see teenage boys at his home at all hours of the day and night. At a hearing on 28th December 2001, the two boys were brought in wearing jail-issued green jumpsuits, handcuffs and shackles, looking young and vulnerable and with Alex barely able to see over the witness box, their appearance was dramatically at odds with the details of their confessions. It was stated that Alex had come up with the idea to kill their father and after initially deciding to use a hammer, they changed to an aluminium baseball bat. 
It was, however, Derek who attacked Terry, approaching him while he was asleep in his recliner chair and hitting him on the left side of his face and forehead with the baseball bat. He swung a second time but missed and hit a lamp, but then continued to hit his father approximately 10 more times. The attack was brutal and deadly. Additionally, investigators have found a disturbing note in the family home which had been written by Alex. The note read, My life used to be cloudy before I made friends with Rick. I had a whole lifetime ahead of me, and I didn't know what to do with it. I had no goals. I was confused. Rick let me see what I didn't understand. Life isn't about having a job. My ultimate goal in life now is what his is. It is about sharing your life with someone else's. Before I met Rick, I was straight, but now I am gay. It was established that Ricky had let the boys stay at his home when they ran away on the 16th of November, before returning them home the following week. During Alex's confession to the police, he said that his father had been mentally abusing him, but that he did not know this until Ricky had told him. Alex also claimed that Terry was not his biological father. Terry's brother, Greg King, believed it was Ricky who had convinced Alex of this. The request for bond was denied and the boys showed no emotion throughout the proceedings, even when the prosecutor, David Rimmer, showed crime scene photographs, including one of their dead father. With the trial date being delayed, the boys and Ricky all remained in custody. In March 2002, it was reported that both boys had been trying to harm both themselves and others whilst in prison. Also, Ricky had attempted to get a message to Alex by carving it in the jail recreation yard. Alex, don't trust, was spotted scratched with a small rock into a cement floor. The message was unfinished. By April 2002, Alex and Derek had changed their story. On the 9th of April, they testified in front of a grand jury that Ricky had killed their father and that they were outside of the house when the murder occurred. The following day, Ricky was indicted on further charges, first degree murder, arson and the sexual battery of Alex. This had no effect on the murder charges that Alex and Derek faced. All three pleaded not guilty to murder and, in an unusual move, all three would be tried for the same crime with two separate juries, one for Ricky and one for the boys. At the end of August 2002, the jury selection began for both trials. Ricky would be tried first, with Alex and Derek going to trial immediately after. At Ricky's trial, the brothers testified that it was Ricky who had killed their father. The boys stated that they had to leave the back door unlocked so that Ricky could sneak in on the night of the murder. When Terry and the boys returned home from a friend's house at around midnight, Alex unlocked the door. The two boys played some games and then Derek fell asleep. Ricky crept in, woke Derek and told them to go out of the back door and get in the trunk of his Nissan Maxima. The next thing they remember was being at Ricky's house and him telling them what he had done to their father. They said that Ricky convinced them to take the fall for his crime because they would be able to get away with it due to their age and that they could claim self-defense. The boys had wanted to protect their friend but then changed their story because they did not want to spend the rest of their lives in prison. Both of the boys said that Ricky had convinced them that their father was mentally abusive. Ricky's attorney, Michael Rollo, disputed the boys' evidence and pointed out the discrepancies between this and their previous testimony. He also revealed that when the fire was started, a variety of liquids were used as an accelerant. Kevin Fedot, a lieutenant with the State Fire Marshal's office, testified that the shoes that Alex and Derek had been wearing on the night of the murder were covered with something resembling paint thinner, a commonly used accelerant. The boys had also testified that Ricky and Terry had struggled before the murder, but there was no evidence to support this. A psychologist testified that Derek had all the signs of a classic psychopath. Superficial charm, constant lying, no emotional responsibility, and a lack of remorse or empathy. Their mother, who was now going by the name of Kelly Marino, testified that the boys had confessed to the murder during her visit to them after their arrest. 
Tapes of the boys' earlier confessions were played in court. These perfectly matched the crime scene. They included Alex's detailed description of his father after the attack and how Terry had been gasping for breath in his last moments. The accuracy in this description would seem unlikely for someone who had never witnessed a person dying. Due to the lack of any evidence of Ricky's direct involvement in the murder, the defence asked for the case to be thrown out. This request was denied. The jury began their deliberations on Ricky's guilt on Friday the 30th of August and after around seven hours, they finally reached a verdict. This verdict would remain sealed until the brother's trial was completed so as not to affect the outcome. At Alex and Derek's trial, when called to testify, Ricky invoked his Fifth Amendment right to protect against self-incrimination. Much of the testimony echoed that given in his previous trial, Alex's attorney, James Stokes, said that Ricky convinced the boys that they were being mistreated. He then killed Terry and convinced them to take the fall for his actions. Defence attorneys questioned whether Terry had become aware of what Ricky had been doing to Alex and this could have been the motive for Ricky killing Terry. They also claimed that the scope of the investigation had been far too narrow, only focusing on the boys, so Ricky's involvement, such as checking his clothes for evidence, may have been missed. The jury of three men and three women began their deliberations on Friday the 6th of September and five hours later a verdict was given. Derek and Alex King were both found guilty of the second degree murder of their father Terry and of setting their house on fire to cover up their actions. Ricky's verdict was also unsealed. He was found not guilty of murder. Many petitions and campaigns for leniency were soon underway with arguments made that at the age of 12 and 13, the boys should never have been tried as adults. The case caused a divide in public opinion with some saying that they should be held accountable for this violent crime, whilst others felt that at such a young age, they should be treated as children, not adults, and considered for help and rehabilitation and not harsh punishment. Derek and Alex's sentencing was delayed, whilst defence motions for a new trial were considered. The defence attorneys sought a new trial based on two points, that the jury returned an improper verdict and that the assistant state attorney was guilty of prosecutorial misconduct when he tried three people for one murder. The assistant state attorney stood by his decision, arguing that three people were involved, that Derek had swung the fatal blows Ricky had orchestrated the attack and Alex had participated in it. In yet another twist to this ongoing case, the judge then threw out the murder convictions against Derek and Alex and ordered prosecutors and defence attorneys to begin talks to settle the case. The judge stated that the boys' trial was unfair and that they did not receive due process of law. He cited a series of unusual and bizarre events including conflicting statements and testimony, and the fact that he had been forced to secretly open the sealed verdict from Ricky's trial early due to the possibility that all three defendants could have been found guilty on conflicting evidence. He stated that a new trial would be ordered, but this would take several weeks, which he hoped would provide the time for the matter to be settled in mediation. In early November, mediation commenced and on Friday the 15th, an agreement was reached. The brothers were convicted of third degree murder. Derek was sentenced to eight years and Alex to seven, both with credit for the year that they had already spent in Escambia County Jail. Alex became the youngest prisoner in the state system. Ricky went on trial in February 2003 for kidnapping and molesting Alex. The boys testified at the trial, but were seen as vague, evasive and unreliable witnesses. Ricky was acquitted of kidnapping and 10 counts of lewd or lascivious battery. However, he was convicted of false imprisonment and immediately sentenced to five years in prison. The following month, Ricky's third trial began, this time for the accessory charge. He was found guilty of accessory after the fact to first degree murder and evidence tampering. He was immediately sentenced to 30 years on the accessory charge and 5 years for evidence tampering. 
This was the maximum allowed for both crimes, that these would run concurrently. Ricky remains in prison in Florida and is not scheduled to be released until 2032. On 9th of April 2008, 18-year-old Alex was released from custody after serving six years in prison. He went to live with Catherine Medico, a former University of West Florida professor who co-authored a book about the case and believed that the boys were not to blame. Derek was released the following year and was planning to live with his grandmother. That concludes today's story. Thanks for listening to The Case. Please support the channel by clicking like, subscribing and commenting. There is also a buy me a coffee link on the about page. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. I always thought that Florida connected just to Georgia. But thanks to this case, I now realise it goes as far across as Alabama. Goodbye.